In the first chapter of Ephesians, uh, Paul reviews God's original plan for the church, his original plan and purpose for the church. And he says that his original plan and purpose for the church from even before the beginning of time was to bless it with every spiritual blessing available in heaven. And he also reviews for his readers what those blessings are. A way of encouraging them, exhorting them. And then he changes the course of his prayer from thanksgiving, you know, he's giving thanks to God for having blessed the church with all of these spiritual blessings. He changes from doing that to a request for God to enable the Ephesians to truly grasp and appreciate the eternal glory that awaits them in heaven with Christ. Um, you know, I think that's a valid prayer because many times I've seen people have so many blessings, just earthly blessings, good health, perhaps family, you know, meaningful work and so on and so forth, and they're not happy. So they have a lot of things, but the thing that's lacking is the ability to enjoy what they have. And so Paul is describing all of the things that God has given to the church. And then his, the second part of his prayer is, please, Lord, give the church the ability to appreciate and enjoy what they already, what they already have in Christ. And then in the last verse, he makes a, a kind of a transition or a bridge to get to his next topic, which will be uh, about the church itself. It'll center on the church itself. And so in chapter two, he starts to discuss the sinful past of those who are now members of the church and how because of their um, slavery to their own desires or the course of this world, they were subject to God's condemnation. So he, he starts with a blessing and thanksgiving and so on and so forth. And then he starts talking about the common past that everyone in the church has. Everyone in the church comes from the same place, perhaps not culturally or socially, but from a perspective of sinfulness, disobedience to God, everyone shares that same kind of past. And he says because of that, in the past, all of these people were subject to God's condemnation. So this gives them the opportunity to remind them of God's grace and God's mercy in sending Jesus to die for their sins and offer salvation to them, to these sinners, to those who were condemned uh, on the basis of faith and not on the basis of perfectionism. Now we said that God's grace is seen in two ways. Again, I'm still reviewing for those of you who may not have been at this, in this class. First of all, His grace is seen in the fact that He chose to offer us salvation in the first place instead of simply leaving us to perish in our sins. And he could have done that too. He could have said, you know what? I created a perfect world, I gave you everything, and you decided this is not what you wanted, you rejected me, you rejected my word, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, go your way. But he didn't do that. What he did, he offered us salvation. And so the fact that he offered salvation is one you know, aspect of God's mercy, rather than allowing us simply to perish in our sinfulness. The second thing uh, that he mentions is the fact that God offered salvation on the basis of faith and not on the basis of perfectionism, so that everyone could attain to the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So we also spent a little time explaining that in the New Testament, Faith was expressed in belief in Jesus Christ, repentance of sin, and baptism. We explain that baptism, according to the New Testament, is immersion in water. Yes, there is faith. I acknowledge, I, I believe it's true that Jesus is the Son of God, and so on and so forth. And the Bible says the way I express that faith, biblically, according to God's will, is through repentance and baptism. So now that Paul has summarized how and why the church was formed, He's going to start to explain to them its universal nature and deal with a problem that existed among this particular church. So he starts, with, uh, he starts off talking about the universal nature of the church. Uh, 
So far, Paul has described how God relates to the church as a single unit. You know, everybody receives blessings. Everyone is saved in exactly the same way. So from an earthly perspective, however, the church struggled with issues of strife and division because of the cultural and religious differences in each member's background. And so the major fault line at this time was between Jewish Christians who had been converted from Judaism and non-Jewish converts, referred to as Gentiles or Greeks, who had largely come out of various pagan religions. So there was tension, there was friction between these two uh, groups in the church that Paul is addressing here at Ephesus. Of course, there were other difficult uh, differences to deal with, such as you know, the difference between male and female, the attitudes in those days, or slave or free. But in this particular epistle, Paul addresses the problem of unity between Jewish converts to Christianity and Gentile converts to Christianity. It seems that there were poor relations between Jews, and here's the kind of the social background, between Jews in the church who were a minority, but they had the priority in receiving the gospel first, and the Gentile Christians who were in the majority, but they were the newer converts. So each one had a mm, position of pride, if you wish. The Jews could be proud of the fact that, hey, we were the first ones you know, to receive the gospel. We're, the one, we're sophisticated when it comes to religion. We've had training, we know the law, so on and so forth, you know, uh, uh, the rituals. And, uh, you know, we do church really well. You know. Those are the Jews. And the Gentiles say, yeah, but we got more bodies here in the room. <laughs> we can outvote you. <laughs> more people. So if the church was to be universal, as Jesus and the apostles taught, as well as the Old Testament prophets, then the break between Jew and Gentile had to be closed. That breach had to be closed. A simple human solution would have been, you know what, why don't we just have the Gentile church over here and let's have the Jewish church over here. Maybe the Jews will meet in the morning and you Gentiles meet in the afternoon. That way we won't have any problems. You know, that would have been a human solution, but it would not have fulfilled what Jesus is asking us to fulfill. So in chapter two, verses 11 to 22, Paul turns his attention to the Gentile Christians at Ephesus and he explains what Christ has done specifically for them in order to sharpen their gratitude and to strengthen their faith. So we begin with the position of the Gentiles before God. That's how you know, he addresses the Gentiles at the Ephesian church and he says, consider you know, what your position was before God. And so we read in chapter two, beginning in verse 11. He says, therefore remember that for formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. So he says, first of all, you were uncircumcised. Now circumcision was a sign in the flesh that you were included in the covenant between God and Abraham back in the Old Testament. God promised Abraham a promised land, if you wish. He promised him protection and blessings and of course the Messiah to come. And circumcision was the sign in the body that you were part of this promise in your generation. And the idea behind it was every time you bathed, every time you had bodily functions, every time you had uh, uh, sex with your uh, spouse, you, you were reminded of who you were. Because the mark was not just an intellectual marking, it was a marking right there in your most intimate parts. And so, um, you were part of the promise and the, the, the sign of that promise was indelibly marked in your body and you'd have it your whole life. So to be uncircumcised meant that you were separated from God. You were not part of this promise. It was actually a way to curse someone. If you called somebody uncircumcised, that was not just a reference 
to the fact that they had not gone through this procedure, it was actually a curse. It meant you have no part of God, you have no part of the, of the promise. So for the Jews, it was a sign of pride. For the Gentiles, it was a reminder of their ultimate rejection. Gentiles, Paul says, should be grateful that as members of the church, God had removed this barrier between them and Himself. He says, you know, that, that symbol no longer you know, separates the two of us. So he goes on in just verse 12a, he says, remember that you were uh, at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. I'll just stop just halfway through that verse there. So they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth of Israel describes not only the Jewish culture, but also the body of true believers who were regarded as God's people. So Paul reminds them, as Gentiles, they were not part of the group of true believers. They were idolaters, they were pagans. And then again, he says, but now, regardless of their culture, in the church, they could be considered true believers. So circumcision was not something that could separate you from God anymore. The fact that you were not part of the commonwealth of Israel, the, part, the, the fact that you were not part of that culture, a descendant, a blood descendant of, of Abraham, also was no longer a reason to separate you from God. He keeps going in verse 12 and he says, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. Another negative thing, they were strangers of the covenants of, province, uh, the covenants of promise. They had not been promised anything by God. God had not promised the Gentiles land, He hadn't promised them blessings, He hadn't promised them a Messiah. Only the Jews had been promised these things. The only thing awaiting the Gentiles had been condemnation and punishment. And so Paul says, as members of the church, however, they had escaped condemnation. They had escaped suffering. And then one more thing, all in verse 12, lots of things. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of province, uh, promise, having no hope and without God in the world. They had no hope, they had no God. Their religion was false. Their gods helpless to provide any comfort or security. Your religion is not validated by the fact that there are many adherents. Your religion is validated by the power of the one that you worship. So the Gentiles worshiped all kinds of gods and they were in the majority. But the gods that they worshiped had no power. And so their religion, no matter how intricate, no matter how grand, was useless. Because the thing that they worshiped had no power to save them, save them from death. But as members of the church, God Himself was their protector. God Himself was their savior. And so he's contrasting these blessings, or rather contrasting these blessings are the various relationships that the Gentiles have had with the Jews throughout history. It's not mentioned here, but those reading this at that time understood that the relationships are not explained, but they were quite evident to Paul's Gentile and Jewish readers. To understand the magnitude of this reconciliation between Jew and Gentile, one had to understand the past relationship of these two nations. You know, before their respectful conversions, respective conversions, the Jews and the Gentiles, I mean, literally hated each other. It's, just, it's not just they had separate cultures, they hated each other. The Jews had nothing to do with Gentiles. They misunderstood the admonitions in the Old Testament concerning remaining separated from the Gentiles and they actually took it way too far. God did not want them to be influenced by pagan behavior. And many times He used the Jews to punish and eliminate the pagans in the Promised Land. We read about that in the Old Testament. However, 
Once established, they were to serve as a light to, to convert the Gentiles to belief in the true God. They were to be evangelistic. The Jews usually reacted in extremes. They either copied the Gentiles and fell into idolatry themselves, or they despised and rejected them without influencing them for God in any way. You know, for example, a Jew would not allow his shadow to cross the shadow of a Gentile if they were walking in the same place for fear of personal contamination. Or they would do purification rituals if they even touched something that had been previously touched by a non-Jew. Talk about taking it to an extreme. So there was a built-in hatred that had a long history between Jew and Gentile. What was it, the, the thing that was on TV, the Hatfield and the McCoys, you know? Generational hatred, generational feuding. Well, this, they had Jews and Gentiles had generational, centuries old hatred and separation. So, Paul then examines the relationship between Jewish and Gentile converts to Judaism. So first he looks at the relationship between you know, Jews and Gentiles in general and he reminds Gentiles, God, you guys were way, way far away. You didn't have a chance. Now he talks to uh, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles when they, Gentiles were converted to Judaism, which happened. If a Gentile did want to convert to Judaism, there were several things to do. He had to be circumcised, purified in water, and offer a sacrifice. That was the process, the expression of his faith, if you wish. There were limits, however. A Gentile convert could not mingle with the Jews in the inner court of the temple. They were relegated to an outer court, which was reserved for them. It was in this outer court that merchants and money changers had set up shop, depriving the Gentiles even of this faraway access to the temple worship and incurring the wrath of Jesus. One of the reasons for the wrath of, of Christ when He chases the money changers out of the temple, Matthew 21, is the fact that they had set up their booths in the court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles couldn't get any closer than this furthest courtyard. But yet, that courtyard was the place that they would and could worship God. By setting up their booths, they were desecrating that place for the Gentiles. And, and Jesus uh, righteously removes them uh, from this place. So the whole idea in Judaism was that there was a separation between God and the Jews, and there was a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. The barrier between God and the Jews was demonstrated in the fact that they could only approach God through the priests, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, in other words, the presence of God, and then only once per year on behalf of the people. And the barrier between God and the Gentiles was made evident by the fact that the Gentiles were not allowed to enter any part of the temple under pain of death. So God was pure and holy, unapproachable, so that Jews had access only through the priests, convert had access only through the Jews, and Gentiles had no access whatsoever. So, you know, I'm giving you all this to explain that these ideas and, and ways to relate to each other were well ingrained and still very much in the minds of both the Jews and the Gentiles who had converted to Christianity. And if we read between the lines, it seems that the Gentile Christians who had so long felt as second class citizens, now that they were full partners in salvation through Christ, began to despise their Jewish brothers who had despised and rejected them for so long. And it could also be that the Jewish Christians at Ephesus were having a little problem accepting Gentile Christians as equal partners in God's plan of salvation because for so long in the Jewish religion, even if a Gentile had converted to Judaism, he was still a second class citizen within that religion according to the Jews. But now in Christ, everyone was the same. Everyone had all the same blessings. Everyone had the same access. 
And so in the next verse, Paul shows how Christ unifies both Jews and Gentiles in the church before, before God. And so the relationship now between Jew and Gentile converts to Christianity, how is that different? And so first of all, he talks about the Jews and, G and Gentiles united to God. He explains how God reconciles both Jews and Gentiles to Himself. So let's read verse 13, shall we? He says, but now, and he says, but now, because he's been explaining in the past, these things happened in the past. But now, he says, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So Paul says, by His cross, Jesus eliminates the barrier of sin that separated the Gentiles from God. No need for a Jewish priest or any other mediator. Jesus Himself offers His blood to atone for all sin so the Gentile can come before God through Christ at all times. He doesn't need a Jewish mediator. Christ is the mediator for the Gentile. Let's keep reading the passage. Verse 14, he says, For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by, a, uh, by abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, that in Himself He might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So what's true for the Gentile is also true for the Jew. The difference is that the revelation of the sacrifice and salvation was given to the Jew earlier through the law and the sacrificial system and the prophets. But now, he says, both the Jew and the Gentile who were condemned because of sin why? Because the Jew didn't live up to the law, that was sin. He was given the law, great, but he didn't live up to it, so he's condemned because of that. And the Gentile was ignorant of the law, therefore he was guilty of sin. So both the Jew and the Gentile are saved and reconciled, and here's the key, in exactly the same way. Why? Because they both come from the same place. The culture may be different, the religion may be different, but the problem was the same. The Jew was guilty of sin because he didn't live up to the law. The Gentile was guilty of sin because he was ignorant of the law. Both sinned, both condemned, both with the exact same problem before God. And so both Jew and Gentile are saved and reconciled in exactly the same way. The Jew no longer needs the temple, the Gentile no longer needs the Jewish religion. Now the Jew and the Gentile are united to God only by Christ, the common Savior. And so the first step that Paul makes is describe how both Jew and Gentile are united to God. The next step is how the Jew and the Gentile are united to each other. Keep reading, verse 17. He says, and he came and preached peace to you and, uh, who were far away and peace to those who were near. Who do you think the far away are? Well, they're the Gentiles. And who do you think the near are? Well, those are the Jews. And he says, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Stop there, 17 and 18. So the law kept the Jew and the Gentile separate from God. Neither of them could obey it and separate from each other. Why? Because the, the law demanded it. The Jews were not allowed to kind of mix with the Gentiles. So he says, Jesus fulfills all of the demands of the law and thus removes its requirements from both the Jew and the Gentile. Now both groups are united to God and they can be united to each other. Why? Because he who fulfills the law can make a new law. Jesus makes a new law. What's the new law? The new law is unity between Jew and Gentile. That's the new law. So Jews and Gentiles couldn't break down the wall that separated them through marriage or dialogue or politics or economics. But Paul says Jesus is the peace upon which they can be united. 
He is the bridge that unites them. Through faith in Christ, they enter into a unity with God and they share one body with Christ. And of course, the meeting point is baptism, where the old man is buried and the new man is raised. And this is the same both for the Jew and for the Gentile. I mean, it was a problem. What, imagine, imagine the witness before the world of Christianity if Jews and Gentiles were at each other's throat in the church. Well, pff, wouldn't have gotten beyond the first century. All right, so then Paul gives three images of unity between Jew and Gentile, verse 19 to 22. He says the following, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So now Paul describes in a noble, high sense, the beauty of the unity that can exist between a Jew and a Gentile. He calls them, first of all, a kingdom of saints. A kingdom of saints where Gentiles have the same rights and privileges as the Jews. You know, when everybody has the same privilege, there can be unity. Isn't that the problem in our society? Isn't that what the courts always fight about? Civil rights groups fight about, so on and so forth. What, do, what are they always fighting about? We want equal rights for everybody, for men, for women, for those who are handicapped, for those who come from a different culture, we, we feel that we want everyone to have the exact same rights. How successful are we at it? Sort of, kind of, right? <laughs> sort of, kind of. So Paul says, in the church, however, we, we have all the same rights and all the same privileges because we've all come to God in exactly the same way. We've acknowledged that we were separated from God, no matter who we were. And we have expressed our faith in His Son in exactly the same way, no matter when we have lived, where we have lived, or who we are. Whether it's a different culture, or social situation, or physical difference. You know, I've baptized black people, white people, Asian people, people that don't speak English, people who are poor, people who are wealthy, people who are well-educated, people who are not well-educated, people who are handicapped, where we actually needed some special devices and two or three people to get that person in the water because they couldn't walk out of their wheelchair into, you know. In 33 years or so of ministry, all kinds of different people, but they all did exactly the same thing in obedience to God. They said, I asked them, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? In a variety of ways they said, well, yes I do, or yes, or amen, and uh, most certainly I do believe Jesus is the Son of God. And then the water sometimes was cold, sometimes it was hot, sometimes it was lukewarm, sometimes there was lots of water, sometimes there wasn't too much water in a building, outside a building, in a lake but it was always in the water. And it was always in the name of Jesus. And it was always for exactly the same thing, that your sins may be forgiven and that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The sins forgiven wipes out the past. The gift of the Holy Spirit guarantees the future into eternity. All the same. And if I brought different people up here, of course, uh, I think first of all of Dayton who you know, has been ministering much, much longer than I have, he would have the exact same story. Uh, perhaps a lot more countries that he's visited than I have, you know, but the exact same thing would have happened in his ministry and, and, and the same thing uh, with all of you. And so he says, Paul, you're the kingdom of saints. You've all come to, the, to God in exactly the same way. Therefore, you all receive the same thing. He calls them a family or a household where all the members have the same father. 
When I went to Haiti many years ago to preach, uh, of course they all speak French there, uh, the man who was leading the prayer stood up and said, dear father, mon père, père céleste, heavenly father in French, père céleste. He addressed the father in a different language, in a different culture, but the father he was addressing is the same father that I'm addressing and that all men and women have addressed in their prayers throughout history. The Father. And why do we call Him Father? Because we all belong to His household. We are His children. Where Christ is the foundation and each member is a stone, excuse me, where all members have exactly the same father and the same relationship with one another. Brother, why do you think we call each other brother and sister? because we're in the same family. It's easy here, because we're, well, let me see now, we're all white, <laughs> well, various shades anyways. But if you go to a congregation like in Montreal where there are perhaps 18 different cultural groups from Africa, from the Philippines, from South America, from the United States, uh, from everywhere, there it's much more um, significant when you say brothers and sisters because they're not all white and they don't all speak English. And yet everyone's brother and sister. And then he says they're a spiritual temple where Christ is the foundation and each member is a stone and God is the builder. We are all part of the same thing. We are all working towards the same goal. And so Paul says the church is at once all of these things because everyone is united in and through Christ. We can all agree to these things. So Paul explains the universal nature of the church by outlining the way that God has brought together the most disparate of groups at that time, Jews and Gentiles. And the lesson for us is very simple. If these two groups that had centuries of separation and hatred between them, and it was mutual, the Gentiles hated the Jews, to Jews despised the Gentiles, and this went on, this was ingrained for centuries. The lesson for us is, if these two groups could come together in Christ and obey Jesus' command concerning unity, well, certainly we, you know, we can do it too. We don't have generational hatred towards any culture or any people. Certainly we can attain the same goal in this day and age. Well, anyways, in the next chapter, uh, Paul will continue on with this theme and he's going to discuss his own role in God's plan of creating a body into which all men can be united. But we're going to continue with this theme of unity that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians.